good morning and a happy and blessed Sabbath to everyone. May God richly bless you as you worship with us today. Our thought for meditation is taken from E.G. White's writings, My Life Today, page 31. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. See James chapter 4, verse 10. If ever there was a time when every house should be a house of prayer, it is now. Prayer is communion with God, the fountain of wisdom, the source of strength, and peace and happiness. By sincere, earnest prayer, parents should make a hedge about their children. They should pray with full faith that God will abide with them and that holy angels will guard them and their children from Satan's cruel power. May this reading be a blessing to all of us. May I invite all to join me as we plead for the Holy Spirit 
to guide, teach, and convict us at this moment. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the time that we will be spending with you through the word and by the Holy Spirit and the ministry of the angels. We are in the audience of God himself. Help us to be reverent, to keep our eyes and ears focused and keep our hearts open to the influences, the real influencer, that is the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'd like to continue our topic on the significance of Christ's birth and incarnation, but more specifically addressing that both the, the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ, Christ the incarnated Savior in his flesh nature. And we will touch both on the temptation of Christ in the wilderness compared to the temptation of the first Adam in the Garden of Eden. So as a beginner, let's turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 13 to 15. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 13 to 15. And I'm going to bring, begin to read from the King James Version. Verse 13 says, For Adam was not, or rather, for Adam was first formed than Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in transgression. Verse 15 says, Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing if they, referring to both Adam and Eve, shall continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. That's very important to read in connection with understanding the two Adams. The first Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. So as we read to that, let us bear in mind that Christ was called the second Adam. And I'm going to read about that. And, and we just had Easter, the resurrection uh, being celebrated, and these verses will help us understand what the truth is. It is very profound. It can never be replaced or counterfeited, but we need to know the Word of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I'm going to begin to read now, and I want you to read with me from your Bibles. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 beginning with verse 34 down to verse 50. It says here, awake. Definitely it's referring to people or ears that have to respond because they're asleep or dead. Now death is of two kinds, spiritual death and literal death. And here it says, Awake to righteousness and sin not. They are connected. If we would awake from that death sleep in sin, we must awake to righteousness, which is the opposite of unrighteousness. And not only that, to sin not, or not to continue to sin. For some have not the knowledge of God, I speak this to your shame. We should be actually ashamed if we think otherwise. But we need to be instructed. And by responding and accepting the truth as it is in Jesus, we are saved from deception. Verse 35 says, But some men will say, Well, how are the dead raised up or resurrected? And with what body? Do they come? The answer there is, Thou fool. That which thou sowest is not quickened, except it first die. 
Paul's going to make the same analogy between planting and sowing and harvesting. And before there could be any life, the seed must first die or be buried on the earth. And Jesus was called the seed of the woman. So strong words here are appropriate. We need to hear this. Some will say, how are the dead raised up? How was Christ raised up, in other words? And with what body do they come? And what body did Christ resurrect from? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened, made alive, except it first die. Then in verse 37, and that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but the bare grain first. It may be of wheat or some other grain, perhaps. But God gives it a body as it pleased him, and to every seed his own body. First the seed, then the ear, then the full corn shall appear. And then we are told too that all flesh is not the same flesh. They're not interchangeable, not in nature, especially in spiritual application. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men. There's another kind of flesh of beasts, another kind of flesh of fishes, another kind of flesh of birds. There are also celestial bodies, heavenly bodies, and then bodies that are terrestrial or of the earthly nature. But the glory of the celestial one is one, and the, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. They're not the same. Then there is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and then another glory of the stars. For one star differeth, differeth from one star in glory. If you look at the sky, you will see this in verity. So also, see now we're talking this, this is the resurrection. So also is the resurrection of the dead. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, but it is raised into incorruption. It is sown in dishonor, but it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, but it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written. Go back to Adam now. The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. Now, you know how this is related in the book of Genesis. From the dust of the ground, the form of man is put together, but it is not alive till the creator breathes into his nostrils and then says, he became a living soul. So a living soul is the whole person. So And so it is written, the first man, Adam, very clear, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. And then the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, referring to the first Adam, and then afterward is the second Adam who is spiritual. The first ma man or Adam is of the earth, earthy, that's where he came from. That as we've been studying about the incarnation of Christ, a body was prepared for him. And so, the first man is of the earth, earthy. Second man is of the Lord of the heaven. Imagine this. Can you just picture this? One is from the earth. The other is from heaven. But both bear the same name, Adam, for a purpose. 
The plan of redemption is revealed here. So in verse 48 says, As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. That's where we can trace our origin, not in evolution, but at creation. Okay. As is the earthy, such are they also, all of us that are earthy, and as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly in the new birth and in the resurrection from the dead in sin. We retrace back our genealogy spiritually, not to the first Adam who fell, but to the second Adam who gained the victory. And so in verse 49 it says, And as we have borne the image of the earthy, that's why we're first called out from darkness before we can enter into the marvelous light of God's glory. So as we have borne the image of the earthy, that is by the power of heredity, and our fallen nature, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly through the second Adam. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit corruption. There has to be a change. Not when Christ comes, but before he does. That's where the transformation takes place, tracing from the original fallen Adam and in the new birth, tracing us back now to the new generation in Christ Jesus, the second Adam. And so Paul is able to write this so we understand this. Behold, after stating all that, I show you a mystery. We have been talking about mysteries here. The mystery of the gospel, the mystery withheld from ages, which was now revealed, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, the mystery of the incarnation, that God was manifest in the flesh. This is part of this. It says, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Now, of course, the word sleep here has nothing to do with going to bed, but this is the death, okay? We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. How quick in a moment, in the blink or a twinkling of an eye, when at the last trumpet, there are seven trumpets in Revelation, we will cover this. The last trump of that or the last trumpet is what is spoken out here. For the trumpet shall sound, and now you see the word dead describing the dead or the, those who sleep in Christ shall be raised incorruptible. That's called the resurrection of the just. And then we shall all be changed. That change is, of course, not a change of character, but a change of mortal to immortal and corruptible flesh to incorruptible. And we see that right there in the next verse. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, otherwise it shall not enter in here the kingdom of God. That's what it says there. This corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality, so that when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then, then shall be brought to pass. It shall come to pass, shall be brought to pass, what shall be brought to pass, the saying that is written. It's not only a thus saith the Lord, it is written. The saying that is written, and what is it? O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. In other words, and I'll give you an illustration. Men fear death. That's why they invent all kinds of 
changes that takes place when death happens. Person goes to heaven, all these things. Now, I need not go through this. You are aware of this. All religions have their kind of interpretation outside of what the Bible teaches us. But remember this. Death is a certainty. That is what is certain. When a man is born, he begins to die. That is the paradox of mortality until it shall be changed to immortal when Christ comes and that is given as a crown, a reward, which Christ brings to the faithful. So it says here that the sting of death is sin. Now think about wasps and bees with stings. Even lions, the king of the beasts, run away from the attack of beasts because of their little sting. Now it says there, the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. In other words, we would have no knowledge of sin and its consequences and rewards and its wages without the law of God. And the law is eternal. As long as the law of God exists and it is the foundation of his eternal throne, there stands the definition of what sin is, the transgression of the law. However, look at what it says there. The sting of death is sin. Since all men shall die, where do we receive the hope after death, it begins before the second coming. Where? When we obey the law of God. Then there is no fear of death. Because that death is the first death to which there is a resurrection. It is the second death of the wicked that causes us fear. But when we remove that guilt, as a sting of a bee is removed, you wouldn't be scared, afraid of the bee, neither of death. In fact, in the teaching of the Bible, the dead in Christ rest in Christ. For their works do follow them. They rest from all their labors. That's why Paul could write this only in this context, only in this explanation, Never take it out of context, because many do this. Following the verses, but thanks be to God. Only then can we say thanks be to God, honestly. Okay. Which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, the second Adam. Therefore, my beloved brethren, that's the church, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Once more, those who die in the Lord, a blessing is pronounced upon them. Revelation 14, 13. Blessed the dead who die in the Lord, for they rest from their labors and their works do follow them. How wonderful the truth is when we are get obtaining it from the Bible. Then there is a hope that doesn't disappoint. There is no deception. There is no guile that comes from the word and the mouth of the second Adam, the incarnated creator, Jesus Christ. Now, there, there's a fourfold, fourfold lie and deception embedded in the first temptation alone of Christ in the wilderness. And I'm going to share this with all of you. And I've obtained it from the, the an article called Confrontation, which was originally published under the title of Redemption or the Temptation of Christ in the Wilderness by Ellen White, pages 37 to 40. 
And I will share this with you. Shed so much light, it magnifies the truth of the Bible. You know, when Christ, it's so important to understand the significance of Christ, the incarnated creator who took on our nature, that kind of human nature that is subject to temptation and is capable of yielding because temptation is no temptation unless there's a possibility of yielding. But temptation in and of itself is not temptation. Yielding is. And so I'm going to cover this in another topic when we study the willing consent of the governed. The willing consent of the governed is the secret of the victory over sin. The consent of the sinner to work with the Savior. Humanity fallen, united with divinity, becomes invincible to the temptations of Christ. That's why you could say, thanks be to God for the victory in Christ Jesus, the second Adam. When Christ bore the temptation, the test of temptation, it was a test, it is a test, and will continue to be a test increasing in intensity as prophesied. So when Christ bore the test of temptation upon the point of appetite, that was the first point. He did not stand in the beautiful Eden as did the first Adam. With the light of and love of God seen in everything his eyes rested upon. That was the environment of the first Adam. But the second Adam, Christ, was in a barren, desolate wilderness surrounded with wild beasts. By the way, let me just point this out. This second wilderness in the antitype is the world itself, the wilderness of sin. And the Christian is going through this wilderness and he is headed for the true paradise of God, the antitypical promised land. Everything around him was repulsive. Here are the contrasts, the two Adams. With its surroundings, Jesus fasted 40 days and four nights. And in those days, the scripture says, he did eat nothing. He was emaciated. That was his physical appearance. He was emaciated through long fasting. And that is the human nature that he adopted. He felt the keenest sense of hunger. His face was indeed marred like the sons of man. That's exactly the wording that you find in Isaiah 52, 14. His face was marred, his visage. So Christ thus entered upon his life of conflict to overcome the mighty foe. In bearing the very, that very test which the first Adam failed to endure, so that through successful conflict, he might break the power of Satan and thereby redeem You've heard that song, Redeemed by the Blood of the Lamb? There's more to this. You need to understand, you and I need to understand that the, the, the reason why Christ incarnated in the human nature was in, to endure the very temptations in which the first Adam fell. And if he succeeded, he would be able to redeem the human race from the disgrace of that fall in the Garden of Eden. In fact, all was lost when Adam yielded to the power of appetite, not just food. The last of the eye, the last of the flesh, the lot of this world. That's what's comprehended in the word appetite or desire or longing or urges. The Redeemer in whom both the human and divine were united stood in Adam's place 
he endured a terrible fast of nearly six weeks. The length of this fast is the strongest evidence of the great sinfulness of debased appetite and the power it has upon the fallen human family. And so here's why understanding Christ's human, di human divine nature is absolutely essential to eternal salvation. The humanity of Christ reached to the very depths of human wretchedness and identified itself with the weaknesses and necessities as well of fallen man, while his divine nature grasped the eternal. One was the temporal and fallen, the other was the eternal and sinless. His work of bearing the guilt of man's transgression was not in order to give him the license to continue to violate the law of God, for transgression made men a debtor to the law. That's what Paul writes. We are, we are debtors to the law for having transgressed the law. And Christ himself was, our, as a substitute and surety, was paying this debt, which was ours, by his own suffering. He suffered temptation. So the trials and sufferings of Christ were to impress man with a sense of his great sin, the exceeding sinfulness of sin in breaking the law of God, and then to bring him to repentance and then obedience to that law. And through obedience, and through obedience, acceptance with God. You see that process? That call, that beckoning, that invitation, when a response is made, then progress is announced, step by step. Here, God would impute or put into the account of man. He would impute his own righteousness to man and thereby would raise man in moral value with God so that his efforts to keep the divine law would be acceptable. We need to underline that and repeat that. Only by Christ imputing his perfect righteousness to the repentant and obedient sinner will even his obedience be of any moment, any moment, any value. It has to be mingled and imputed with the righteousness of Christ. That's why we're totally dependent upon Christ. Note that when our efforts only become acceptable with God, it's because of the righteousness imputed to us of Christ. So Christ's work was to reconcile man, reconciliation, to God through his human nature. That could not be the reconciliation, the message of reconciliation, the work of reconciliation which Paul writes about could not be possible between fallen man and God unless Christ himself incarnated into our human nature. So Christ's work was to reconcile man to the Father through his human nature and God to man through his divine nature. This is how this works, my friends. This is the main, I would say, main pipeline, or uh, in the next study, we're going to do the ladder. The ladder that Jacob was shown in a dream vision that revealed the plan of redemption. I'll give you a heads up. We're going to do a study called the two stairways to heaven. One is the Jacob's ladder, and the other is, think about that, Peter's ladder. When we combine the two, we will obtain a greater and a deeper understanding of God's love for us and the power 
to be totally and fully redeemed from, from Satan's deception and his captivity. That is what means to be set free by the deliverance of God. What were the first fourfold deception embedded in the first temptation alone? Remember, there are three of them. In the first temptation, as soon as the long fast of Christ began, Satan was at hand with his temptation. He didn't just come to Christ when it was at the very verge of human death at four days. He began right in the beginning. He was observing keenly the deterioration of the human nature of Christ because of fasting. He came to Christ, number one, his first temptation, enshrouded with light, claiming to be one of the angels from the throne of God, sent upon an errand of mercy to sympathize with him and to relieve him of his sufferings and condition. He tried to make Christ believe that, number two, God did not require him to pass through the self-denial and sufferings that he anticipated, and that he, Satan, had been sent from heaven to bear to him a message that God only designed to prove his willingness to endure. Then Satan told Christ, number three, that he was to set his feet in the blood spot stained path, but that he would not travel through it. That like Abraham, okay, 42 generations earlier, in Matthew 1, 17, he was only tested to show his perfect obedience. And then number four, he also stated that he was the angel that stayed the hand of Abraham. <laughs> as the knife was raised to slay his only begotten son, Isaac. And so he, the same person, allegedly had now come to save his life so that it was not necessary for him to endure this painful hunger and death from starvation and that he would help him bear the work in the plan of salvation. I'm going to end right here and pick it up on the other side. But I want you to contemplate, prayerfully meditate, and study this topic because all of us are subject to this temptation. Unless we understand how to follow the example of Christ, we are lost. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for these lessons that we're learning. I pray, Lord, that we will be humble meek, teachable, lowly of heart, and submit our will to you so that you can admit us into favor with you and the Father through the Holy Spirit. Bless us now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.